you've um, got an exciting new position, you're into the mix, you're starting to climb up the learning curve. Um, it's exciting times, but it's also potentially times of you know, a certain amount of tension, a certain amount of apprehension. Am I really going to have an impact? Maybe you're a little further in, right, and you've begun to get some traction in the role, but you're starting to hit some points of frustration, which is virtually inevitable when you take a new role. Um, for others of you, perhaps you're reporting to somebody who's in transition. As I'm sure you know, um, having a new boss is a challenge, always, right? And I think that in the research we've done on this, we find that people actually have had more bosses than they've had jobs, right? And, and you know, it's a consistent statistic. It's partly because as leaders go up through organizations, <clears throat> the cycle time tends to go up for a while, right, until you hit the very pinnacle of the organization. So when we do research on you know, people's transition experience, we consistently find that they have had more bosses than they have had jobs. And that's a pretty interesting uh, situation. And how do you respond when you've got a new boss? Someone who's in transition themselves, is assessing you and other people in your organization, you know, and you're trying to think about how do I position myself with regard to that, uh, that new boss. Possibly some of you um, have inherited new teams, which is another really interesting kind of dimension to this because, as I'll talk about a little bit later, most leaders taking new roles don't get to build teams. They get to inherit somebody else's team, and then they need to think about how to assess that team, reshape that team, accelerate that team in, in, uh, in new directions. For some of you, potentially, you're hiring people, right? You've gone through a process of working with a great recruiting company, executive search company, you've brought someone into your organization, but that's really only the starting point, right? You've got this great person, but they've got to be successfully onboarded, and more importantly, they've got to be successfully integrated into the organization to really have the impact that you hope they are going to have. For most of you, I'm guessing, you have organizations where there's a lot of change going on. Um, I survey when I do programs uh, participants and ask them sort of to what degree is change going on in, on their organizations? Is it major change, minor change, no change? I used to get, you know, a few years back, a small number of people that would say there's no real significant change going on in my organization. I never get that anymore, right? And it's very much, you know, gone in the direction of major change going on. Anytime you've got a lot of change going on in your organization, you've got a lot of transitions going on in your organization. People taking new roles, teams forming or reforming, attempts to really try to, you know, make these very high stakes transformation efforts uh, succeed. And it's here too that some of what we're going to talk about today, I think you're going to find quite, quite valuable. So I'm going to talk about transitions in the first 90 days sort of at three distinct levels. And I'm going to pause as I do that, as I go through each one, just to take some questions. I'd love to have it be uh, interactive, as Kathy indicated. But I'm going to start with the level of leaders in transition. I'm then going to talk a little bit about teams in transition and how to think about that. And finally, I'm going to talk about some of the implications of this for organizational transformation. And that's basically the structure we're going, we're going to go to. So just a quick poll around the table. So how many of you personally uh, are six months or less in your current roles? Anybody? Okay, terrific. How many of you have a boss who is six months or less in their current roles? Great. How many of you have a peer on a leadership team of which you are a part who's six months or less in their current roles? How many of you have hired somebody onto a team that you lead who is six months or less in their current roles? Any questions? <laughs> right. And I, I say this seriously, right, because I think that my observation these days is that in most organizations, there is a constant flow of transition going on, right? So if, if it's not you personally in transition, it's likely that you're having somebody's transition inflicted on you. And what we know from the research is that every leadership transition materially impacts the performance of a dozen other people, right? So think about the systemic impact of transition on organizations. Also, you know, studies we've done for typical large, meaning Fortune 1000 companies, 
about a quarter of the leaders are taking new roles in those companies every year, right? If you think about what that means, that's about a four-year cycle time in position, so that's not unreasonable. That cycle time rises as you go up, right? So for example, I work pretty extensively with a global um, Fortune 50 healthcare company, and I do programs at the vice president level for new VPs, both promotes internally coming in from the outside, and their cycle time and position is 2.2 years. Right? If you think about what that means, it means that about you know, 40 plus percent of them at that level in that company are taking new jobs every year. Now I'm not going to stand here and tell you I think that's good, right? because there's real issues when you start getting that frequency of transition, but it is the reality today in these organizations. And so the need to make successful transitions and more particularly help leaders make successful transitions I think has never been, uh, never been more important. I got interested in the subject originally, um, I, I hate to say it, in the late 90s. Um, I was still in my late teens at that point. Um, <laughs> but I'd come out of a very different background, international diplomacy, negotiation, game theory. I was talking to Josh a little bit about it. But I got kind of fascinated with the phenomenon of leaders taking new roles. And I talked a little bit you know, to Julia about this before we started, about this very interesting combination of someone in a new role struggling to get up the learning curve and become effective, while at the same time trying to have an impact on their organization. And there was lots of, of work out there about leadership, and there was lots of work out there about change, but there was very little about that combined, combined phenomenon. And I started really looking at failure, right? What are common mistakes that people make going into new roles? Classic mistakes, because what I was seeing was people making those mistakes over and over and over again, yeah? With no real reason why that should happen, and everyone needing to kind of figure it out from scratch as they went up through their careers. And some of the common mistakes won't be surprising to you, right? People who come in with the answer, Right? They're coming into a job, but they've kind of already reached conclusions about what's necessary, often based on what they know how to do, or they've been told that they're there to do. Right? And, you, and you're going to have to forgive me for what I'm going to say, but I, I always tell people that when you get into new roles, you need to very carefully check and recheck your mandate and your expectations, because recruiting is like romance and employment is like marriage. Yeah? <laughs> Sorry. With, you know, we're in a dating business. We are, exactly. <laughs> During recruiting, you know, I'm in my best suit and you look mighty fine. Uh, I'll always do the dishes. <laughs> I, I really like your mother. Yeah. And then there's the cold, harsh light of cohabitation, right? And so, so one classic mistake is that people don't really check to understand fundamentally what their mandate is. How am I going to create value in this role is a question that I say people always should be asking themselves and re-asking themselves on a, on a, on a regular basis. Um, staying with what you know how to do. <clears throat> Another cl classic one, right? Um, Mark Twain you know, had a saying I liked a lot. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> gotcha. to, a, to a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Right? To a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so there can be a tendency on the part of leaders to come in you know, with pretty big hammers. And the hammer is just a metaphor for what you're really good at, right? What's got you to this point in your career. But as Marshall Goldsmith, uh, coach, put it so aptly, right? What got you here is not necessarily going to get you there. And so understanding a second big question, right? What is it I need to develop in terms of skills and capabilities to be fully effective in the new role? And the answer is almost never nothing, right? And often it's pretty big leaps. I'm particularly interested in the transitions that happen as you take someone from senior functional roles or specialist roles into more general management roles. Uh, how managers become leaders about the big shifts that go on as you move from that senior functional role into becoming a true enter enterprise, uh, enterprise leader. Um, I guess just a few other things and then maybe I'd like to open it up a little bit. Um, onboarding, well, types of transitions, right? I, I, I sort of did something that you know, only I think academics can really get away with, right? And uh, what I did was I started out by saying, if you think about it deeply, all transitions are really pretty much the same. 
right? And here's this really great set of principles and tools, this scaffold called the First 90 Days Framework about how to learn, you know, and how to set direction and build alliances. And you can apply it to any transition you go through, right? So that was my, my entry point to this. And then having done that, I said, well, actually, all transitions are different, right? As I said, only academics get away with this kind of stuff, right? And if you think about it clearly, every transition has its own unique you know, capabilities. And so you need to understand fairly deeply what kind of transitions you're going through. And I said transitions with an S because it's often you know, multiple ones that are going on in parallel. So I wrote a second book, which no one's ever heard of, um, called Your Next Move, that's about the distinct types of transitions you go through, onboarding into a new company, promoted to a new level. Right, as a, making an international move would be examples, right? And actually that book's gonna be reissued with a brand new title and a, some other good stuff this spring and hopefully it'll sell more than six copies this time, we'll see. Um, <laughs> um, but my point here is that another key part of this is just understanding that transitions present very different challenges, right? I want you to think a little bit about the last time you took a job. For some of you that's, you know, now. How many of you joined a new organization? as part of that transition. Last time you took a new job, onboarded into a new organization. Okay. How many of you were promoted to a higher level? How many of you were leading people that were formerly your peers? Anybody? How about a newly created role, a role that wasn't in existence before? How about moving geographically? Did you have to move to, to take the new job? And I just give this to you to illustrate, right, that when we look at this systematically, what you find is that leaders are going through typically about three transitions in parallel as they take a new role, right? They're, they're moving to a new organization, they're being promoted, they're moving their families, and so untangling some of that and understanding some of the key challenges is, is a core part of what I think we need to do these days to really, really be um, effective at it. From looking at individuals in transition, I got very interested in what do organizations do to help people make successful transitions into new roles. And at the time, the time I started this, the answer was virtually nothing, right? It was sink or swim, is the way I described it, or leadership development through Darwinian evolution, right? You know, however you want to sort of think about it. Now we've come a long distance from that, that way, that point. More organizations do a better job of onboarding people but very few organizations do a great job of onboarding people, right? We did a study two years ago, published uh, an article in HPR last year called Onboarding Isn't Enough, that looks at the realities of what companies actually provide people when they onboard them. And we went out and just talked to a lot of HR people about what is onboarding to you and what does your organization do and what emerged was that onboarding is kind of a catch-all phrase for a vast range of possible things, right? And that most organizations do a pretty good job of the basics of signing people on, giving them desks and you know, ID cards. Very few do the work of more deeply integrating people into their organizations. If you ask yourself, why do people fail when joining new organizations? Actually, I'll ask you the question. Why do people, what's, what are the biggest reasons why people fail? when they're onboarding into a new organization. Yeah, how? Don't understand, the Don't understand the culture. Good, any other reactions? Critical relationships, Critical relationships that need to be formed are not. You just hit number one and two, right, from you know, major studies that have been done about this. It's not about their leadership capability per se. It's not about their industry knowledge. Right? It's not about their capability to deal with pressure or stress or put together good strategies. It's culture and politics that in the end are what sink people going into new roles. They either don't understand the culture and they fall afoul of it or, and or they don't build the critical relationships they need to build in order to be fully effective. And in the studies we did with, on this, right, fewer than a third of the companies, and these are large companies we were looking at, paid any attention to those two factors, right? To really helping people integrate effectively into the culture or build the right relationships with the key stakeholders. That's a pretty remarkable thing, right? And 
all those companies said they were good at onboarding, right? They were great at onboarding, right? Because to them, onboarding meant, right, signing people up, getting them, you know, in situ, making sure they did compliance training and all the usual, uh, usual stuff that they do. So I'm just going to close this segment with a little bit of an exhortation, right, which is I, I also believe very passionately that organizations should be trying to help everybody take new roles, get some support, and get up to speed faster. We've made some progress, and even as it is, with onboarding people. But very, very few organizations do anything material to help people making equally challenging internal moves get up to, to speed in those roles. And so the work we're doing these days, Rich and I, is really helping companies put in place systems to accelerate everyone, regardless of the types of transitions that they're going through. And the example I gave you of the program at this global healthcare company is an example of that sort of work. It really meshes people being promoted internally to VP roles with people who are being hired from the outside. And we're able to have pretty remarkable conversations, for example, about the culture, about the politics, helping to build those networks, uh, and so on. So I'm going to pause at this point, just you know, as we talk about individual leaders taking new roles. Questions, comments, observations. I don't feel like I need to kind of give you a lecture on the elements of the first 90 days framework, right? Because I suspect some of you could give that lecture better than I can. Um, but thoughts or questions about this? Does it make sense to you?